So uh, thanks to all of you for coming on this beautiful Oregon morning. Uh, I understand that you guys have typically 75% attendance, which I wish I had 75% attendance in my classes. Uh, on this rainy morning is maybe a good time to think about the desert and dry environments. Um, so uh, I teach evolutionary biology at Willamette. Am I doing a good enough job of kissing the mic? Do I need to be closer? Okay. Awesome. Um, and uh, as evolutionary biologists, one of the really great questions that we're trying to understand is the diversity of life on Earth. So why there are lots of some things and less of other things, uh, and how those organisms came to exist. Um, and so we're going to start with Darwin, and we're going to talk about Darwin's abominable mystery. Um, and I have a whole other lecture really that I could go on about, about Darwin as a great reluctant revolutionary. Um, but I'm going to really say about his biography today is to say that uh, Darwin really did for biology what Newton had done for physics, which is that Darwin articulated the perspective that the biological world could be explained by natural laws. So very much in the same way that the orbit of the Earth around the sun or the movement of comets can be explained by gravity, Darwin's argument is that the biological world that we see can be explained by natural laws. And so he writes in The Origin, birds singing in the bushes, insects flitting about, worms crawling through the damp Earth have all been produced by the laws acting around us. And for Darwin, when he says laws, really he means natural selection. Today, we would think of those laws as including a bunch of other processes, including mutation, something called natural uh, genetic drift, gene flow, things like that. Um, but this f basic idea that we can understand the biological world from understanding natural laws is really at the heart of modern biology. Um, and the things I'm going to be talking about today is how we can try to understand the diversity of organisms from thinking about natural laws and natural processes. And as I mentioned, one of the really big questions that um, evolutionary biologists are interested in, that I'm interested in, is trying to understand why there are lots and lots of some kinds of things and not very many of others. And the things that I'm really especially interested in are plants and insects, which together are the most diverse organisms on Earth. And when I say the most diverse, I mean there's the most kinds, there's the most species of those. Yeah? Um, so, for example, um, thinking about multicellular organisms, so oh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to do a good job here with not doing this and not doing that. Um, uh, we think about multicellular organisms, so I'm ignoring all of bacteria right now because I have this bias towards big things that I can see. Um, thinking about multicellular organisms are what we would call eukaryotes. The insects account for more than half of all species. Um, uh, and the beetles alone, so beetles are a kind of insect, uh, with 350,000 species account for about a quarter of all living things. Yeah. Um, and famously, uh, the uh, 20th century geneticist and one of the architects of the modern evolutionary synthesis, a guy named J.B.S. Haldane, uh, at one point was asked what his studies of biology had taught him about the creator, and Haldane repl replied, well, he seems to have an inordinate fondness for beetles. <laughs> and although this was undoubtedly kind of a sarcastic remark, it really is true. The diversity of beetles is astounding. Here's a leaf beetle, uh, a longhorn beetle, a metallic wood boring beetle, uh, a ground beetle called a caterpillar hunter, another caterpillar hunter, an aquatic diving beetle, uh, a carrion beetle, an ant mimicking beetle, uh, another longhorn. You're going to see a lot of longhorns because they're my favorite. Uh, yet another longhorn, a blue one. Uh, another metallic wood boring beetle that doesn't look metallic. Uh, a weevil, the weevils with these big long snouts are the most diverse group of beetles. Here's another weevil that mimics an ant. Uh, 
and yet another longhorn beetle. Um, and not only are they awesome to look at and spectacular, there really is a, just an insane number of them. So essentially for every kind of plant out there, there is at least one kind of beetle that specializes on that plant. Um, and in some ways, this is kind of a bait and switch because apart from these awesome pictures, I'm mostly not gonna talk about beetles today, although that was what I studied in graduate school. Uh, I'm mostly actually gonna talk about plants. And next to the insects, plants are the second most diverse group of organisms on Earth. Um, so looking again at all of the eukaryotes or all of the multicellular organisms, um, uh, plants account for about 22% of all described species. Um, and if we uh, sort of look within the plants, um, we see a yet even more kind of uneven distribution, which is that, um, so there are lots of different kinds of plants out there. There's, as we know in Oregon, there's lots of moss, and there are ferns, and there are pine trees. Those account for actually a very tiny fraction of all the kinds of plants that are out there. Most of the plants that are out there are plants with flowers. Um, and uh, Darwin actually found that fact, the fact that there's more kinds of flowering plants than any other kind of plant to be a really big problem. Uh, in fact, oh, okay, and sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, it is actually very surprising that there are so many kinds of flowering plants. And the reason it's surprising is that flowering plants are also evolutionarily very new in terms of evolutionary time. So for example, um, in looking at the fossil record, we see the first things that we can really identify as being probably plants uh, beginning about 400 million years ago. There probably were plants living on land before that, but these are the oldest fossils that we can see. Um, and so this is something called Cooksonia. Uh, it's dated about 435 million years ago and it is likely related either to a moss or something called a club moss, so a pteridophyte. Um, beginning around 360 million years ago, so still before the dinosaurs, um, we start to see things that we can pretty well identify as ferns. Um, here's something called Rachophyton chondrosorum, uh, a fossil fern. And by 300 million years ago, we start to see the first conifers, so plants with cones, things like uh, cedars or pine trees or junipers. The first things that we think are probably flowering plants don't show up until about 135 million years ago, so the beginning of the dinosaur era. So that still seems like a way long time ago to me, but remember, this is essentially one-third as much time as what we see for mosses, right? So the first moss-like plants are showing up 400 million years ago. These flowering plants are showing up 135 million years ago. And yet, um, almost all of the plants that we see out there are plants with flowers. And in the fossil record, we see that guy show up about 130 million years ago, and then very quickly, very shortly after that, there's suddenly all these many kinds of flowering plants showing up in the fossil record. And Darwin actually considered that to be a serious problem for the theory of evolution. And the reason he considered it to be a problem was that Darwin was thinking about evolution as a slow, gradual process that takes place over eons. And here you see flowering plants show up, and then suddenly there's thousands of them. And he actually speculated, you know, maybe somewhere out there, like there's all this fossil history of flowering plants that's actually missing. Like maybe they initially originated on some lost continent that's now under the sea. And if we could just find that continent, we'd find all this past history and they're actually older than we realize. At this point, we're pretty confident that actually flowering plants really are relatively young and there's just lots of them. Does that make sense, this problem he's presenting? One of the ways, yes. No, okay, okay. <laughs> the, the, they, they flag me down. Um, don't do it, okay. I, I promise I'll call on you in the question and answer section. How about that?
so um, one of the ways that evolutionary theory has changed a bit since Darwin's time is we now recognize actually that evolution can take place very, very quickly. In fact, one of the things I talk about in my non-majors class is that if we think about something like the HIV virus, we know that it can evolve dramatically in the course of one person's infection. It can evolve to be resistant to all drugs in a matter of weeks. Um, but for Darwin, he was thinking about evolution as really slow, and he didn't understand how could we have so many species originate so quickly. Um, and in this letter to uh, the botanist J.D. Hooker, he writes, the rapid development, as far as we can judge, of all of the higher plants within recent geological times is an abominable mystery. In this same letter, he also writes what turns out to be a hint as to what today we think, maybe I think, is the answer to Darwin's abominable mystery. And I'm going to say this uh, hypothesis, this idea about the answer, is kind of controversial. And I'm going to try to present evidence to try and persuade you that, that I'm right. <laughs> or actually, that uh, this French botanist named Saporta was right. So in this same letter, Darwin writes, Saporta believes that there was an astonishingly rapid development of the high plants as soon as flower-frequenting insects were developed and favored intercrossing. So that is, there's something about being pollinated by an animal as opposed to wind. So you guys know if you go into Bush Park in the um, springtime, you see all that um, oak pollen everywhere. Or if you guys have pines in the backyard, you can see it blowing out of the pines. Those are all pollinated by wind. But maybe there's something special about having an animal doing pollination for you. Um, another place that Darwin talks about the specialness of pollinators and one way he argues that maybe pollinators are important to driving the evolution of flowering plants uh, is in a book that he writes about orchids. Um, and one of the famous examples from that is this plant, Anagricum sesquipedale. This is also sometimes called the, the um, Malagasy star comet orchid or sometimes called Darwin's orchid. And the thing that's special about this is that part right there. It looks like a stem, but it's actually what's called a nectar spur. It's actually part of the petal that comes out the back. Way, and it's hollow. Way down in the bottom of that, there's sugar. There's nectar in the bottom. That spur is about a foot and a half long. Um, and you have to think, why would you make this nectar, which ostensibly is to attract insects, and then bury it way down the bottom of this long tube. Yeah? So Darwin knew that often, and by the way, he never saw this growing in nature. Uh, someone sent it to him. After Darwin finished traveling around the world on the Beagle, he essentially never left England again, and very rarely left his house. Uh, he was, came down with some very severe illness. These days, we think it was something called Chagas disease. He was sick the rest of his life. And he married into a super wealthy family, and so he didn't really have to do anything. Um, but people, met, people sent him this through the mail. And he knew that um, often orchids are pollinated by moths, something called hawk moths. And he said, you know what? I'll bet that in Madagascar, where these plants grow, somewhere there's a moth that has a tongue that's a foot and a half long. You know? And in fact, 30 years later, someone discovered this moth called Xanthopan morganii predicta, predicted because Darwin predicted its existence. Um, and by the way, we knew about the plant and we knew about the moth for a long time, but it's only in like the last 20 years that people have actually shown that indeed in Madagascar, these orchids are pollinated by that moth. Yeah. Um, they grow way up in the trees, uh, in the canopy, in the uh, rainforest, really hard, and they only pollinate at night. It's hard to see. Okay, so in this book on the various contrivances by which British and foreign orchids are fertilized by, uh, by insects, he writes an idea about why this um, orchid has this huge long nectar spur and why he thought maybe there might be a moth with a really long tongue. And I'm going to give Darwin's words, and then I'm going to explain it a little bit. So he writes, the proboscis alone was lengthened to obtain nectar. Uh, 
the individual plants of Anagracum, which had the longest nectaries, so the longest nectar spurs, that thing coming out of the back of the plant, um, would be the best fertilized. These plants would yield the most seeds, and the seedlings would generally inherit the long nectaries. So let me draw this out in a somewhat clumsy diagram. So here's this beautiful artist's envisioning of how pollination happens. And I'm going to mess it up by taking that nectar spur and just turning it into a rectangle. <laughs> and so this big, long rectangle, that's supposed to be the nectar spur, so that long tube that has a nectar down the bottom. This pink bar, that's supposed to be the nectar, because I don't know, I think nectar should be pink, like if you're drinking Kool-Aid. Um, and this red line, that's supposed to be the moth's tongue, the moth's proboscis. Yeah? And so in this case, you can see this moth, um, her tongue is not quite as long as the spur. And so to try to get every last little drop of nectar, she's going to take her face and go <laughs> to try and push her face up in there so she can get the very last bit of nectar. And as she does that, her face is going to rub up against the part of the flower where the pollen is. In uh, orchids, pollen actually comes in these little um, sacks, these kind of little packages uh, called pollenia, and that's going to glue to the front of her face. And then when she goes to the next orchid, and <laughs> she pushes that nectar right onto the receptive part. Yeah? Okay. So, but we can imagine, if we think about this from the moth's perspective, she would really like it if she could and so throughout this talk, I'm going to use teleological language. I'm going to talk about organisms as though they're planning what they're going to do in the next several generations. And of course, they're not. Um, I, I don't know what moths are thinking. I have a feeling they're thinking not very much, but who knows. But it makes it easier to talk about, yeah? So if we imagine that she's planning things, she's going to think, you know, oh, so here's my labels. OK. So this moth with the short, uh, short tongue, she's again pushing her face up to get the last bit of nectar. She, however, if she had a longer nectar, uh, a longer tongue, she could actually get all of the nectar all the way down at the bottom. And maybe that moth with a longer tongue, because she's able to drink more nectar, maybe she has more energy, maybe she's able to fly around more, maybe she can take some of that extra energy and make more eggs with it. It turns out that making eggs is actually very energetically expensive. And so maybe those moths that can drink more nectar actually have more babies, and maybe their babies survive better. And so over time, we might expect that uh, moths with longer tongues are going to become more common. And over time, tongues are going to become increasingly long, which is awesome for the moths. Um, but it's actually potentially a problem for the flower, and here's why. Let's imagine that actually we have a moth with a tongue that's longer than the nectar spur. She can now kind of sit back like this and stick her tongue in without actually touching the flower, and so the flower doesn't get pollinated. OK, so if we think about this now from the flower's perspective, it wants to make sure that the moth really has to get in there. And so a flower potentially with a longer nectar spur is going to be more likely to have moths push their face up against them and more likely to get pollinated. And so over time, potentially longer nectar spurs are going to become more common. Yeah? Does that make sense? OK, that idea that I'm talking about is called co-evolution. Co-evolution in the strict sense is when you have two organisms interacting with each other, and one of them evolves in response to the first one, and the second one evolves in response again. So you have this feedback where they're both changing in response to one another. Um, another example of this, which maybe might be a little bit fictional, but um, you could imagine cheetahs and gazelles, and the fastest gazelles are going to survive and get away from the cheetah. And so over time, gazelles get faster. But the fastest cheetahs are going to do better at catching lunch and have more babies. And over time, cheetahs get faster. Um, that's called a co-evolutionary arms race. They're both accelerating. Okay. And Darwin actually is the first person to talk about this idea. So in the same book, he writes, it would appear that there has been a race 
in gaining length between the nectary of anagracum and the proboscis of certain moths. Okay? okay, so at this point we have two ideas that Darwin has put out there. One of them he borrowed from the Frenchman, but that one, maybe pollination, is somehow related to the fact that there's so many plants with flowers, and two, maybe plants and insects co-evolve. Maybe changes in plants can cause changes in insects, and changes in insects can cause changes in plants, or changes in pollinators. There are other things besides insects that pollinate. Birds, bats, stuff like that. Does that make sense? I promise I'll come to the questions. <laughs> okay, and beyond Darwin's awesome uh, story that he kind of spells out there, there are, is also some evidence supporting this. I'm just gonna talk about one fairly simple piece of evidence. There's other studies, um, and some of them contradict one another. But one piece of evidence actually comes from early in the 20th century uh, from a guy named Vern Grant. Uh, Grant actually wrote one of the first articles in the journal Evolution. And what Grant did was just to look at taxonomic keys, so where people had laid out, like, how do you tell the difference between different species of columbine, or different species of daisy, or different species of oak? And what he did was to look at what are the characters that botanists use to tell apart, for example, Gary Oaks from Red Oaks, or um, Dutchman's Breaches from um, Red Columbine. And what he found was that when we look at plants that are pollinated, for example, by wind, so like an oak tree, those plants are actually easier to tell apart or they differ more in things like their trunk and their leaves, um, how high they are. But plants that are pollinated by some kind of animal, so things that are pollinated by birds or butterflies or bees, and especially things that are pollinated by specialized pollinators, so pollinators that only go to one or two different kinds of plants, those things tend to differ more in flowers. So, I have a picture. So, on the left here, here are two different kinds of columbine. The red one that's kind of hanging upside down, that's pollinated by hummingbirds. And the purpley one with the white in it, that's pollinated by hawk moths. So the same kind of moth that pollinates Darwin's orchid. And if you were to look at these columbines, they actually look really, really similar in terms of their leaves and in terms of their, root, their roots. The big difference is in flowers, yeah? On the other hand, here are two different species of grass. That's actually a grass flower. Here's another grass flower. Does anyone know how grass is pollinated? Wind, wind. So um, that's why I remember somebody here was saying to me that they're from Arizona. The horrendous allergies that you get in the summer are from the in invasive grasses that people have brought in and they blow their pollen out in the wind and makes everybody sneeze. Okay, these grasses, to me, their flowers look essentially identical. Does that make sense? Plants that have pollinators differ more in flowers. Plants that are, don't have special pollinators, often the differences are not in flowers but in other things. Yeah? And so Grant argued, you know, maybe what that's telling us is that having pollinators promotes differences in flowers. Natural selection by pollinators makes plants become differentiated in their flowers. Um, and we could also imagine that potentially pollinators, if they're specialized, might also be a way of preventing plants from interbreeding with one another. And that's kind of the, the key thing for making new species, is you stop them from interbreeding. So you know, donkeys, and, or excuse me, uh, horses and mules, no, horses and donkeys, yep. <laughs> horses and donkeys are different species because although they can interbreed, their babies, the mules are sterile. That's what we recognize as being different species. So anything that stops interbreeding can be a potentially a way that you make new species. So for example, if we think about those two uh, columbines, I've drawn them here in cartoon. I think my flowers look pretty good. My hawk moth, maybe not so much. Um, these two flowers don't interbreed with one another because the red one is only visited by hummingbirds and the purple one is only visited by moths. Yeah. We could also imagine that maybe these different pollinators favor different features in each of the two flowers. So for example, um, the fact that this columbine is actually kind of upside down 
makes it easier for a hummingbird to fly in and hover just beneath it. Um, the fact that this one is partly white maybe makes it easier to be seen at night when the moths are active. And so we could imagine then that in addition to this difference, this reproductive isolation, the thing that's preventing them from breeding with one another, that's also uh, allowing the, uh, for, acting as a force of natural selection. So for example, if one of these Aquilegia formosa, these red columbines, um, has a mutation that makes it purple, maybe it's not as attractive to hummingbirds. And so the purple gets weeded out. Or in this case, maybe if there's a hawk moth pollinated columbine that has short nectar spurs, just like we talked about a minute ago, maybe that's disfavored. And so that's selected against. Does that make sense? OK. So potentially two ways that pollinators might be important in making new kinds of flowering plants. One, maybe they can pre prevent closely related species from breeding with one another. And two, maybe they actually favor the evolution of different features depending upon the pollinator. Yeah? OK. So this is the idea. I'm working on trying to test this idea in a particular place. And the particular place is thinking about Joshua trees. And I'm going to argue that this is like the place to try to test this. Okay. Partly because it's what I do, um, but partly because I actually do think it's really special. Um, so if you've not seen a Joshua tree before, that's them. They're weird. Uh, they grow in the Mojave Desert. Uh, some people think of them as kind of like the representative species of the Mojave Desert. If you've seen like any of those Chevy ads, there's always like they're driving down a road with Joshua trees in the background because they look spectacular. Um, people like to take pictures of them doing weird stuff and they do lots of weird stuff like this guy in Joshua Tree National Park. Some people call them the Dr. Seuss tree. Um, some people find them very inspiring for artistic photos like this one. Uh, other people are inspired to take different kinds of artistic photos. <laughs> um, I'll say not everybody thinks that they're beautiful. So for example, uh, this guy uh, named John C. Fremont, has anybody heard of him before? Yeah, so John C. Fremont was uh, an American explorer. Uh, he actually mapped the Oregon Trail and did a lot of exploration of the Mojave Desert in California. Um, he traveled down the Central Valley and then across over the Sierra Nevada into what today is like Coachella and Lancaster. And if we go back and read his uh, diary, he writes, uh, as the day that they crossed the Sierra, crossing the low Sierra and descending a hollow where the spring gushed out, we were struck by the sudden appearance of yucca trees, which gave a strange and southern appearance to the country and well suited, uh, suited well the dry and desert region we were approaching. Associated with the idea of barren sands, their stiff and ungraceful form makes them to the traveler the most repulsive tree in the vegetable kingdom. Um, on the other hand, uh, some people have described them not as repulsive but providential. So for example, according to legend, uh, Mormon settlers traveling on the Mormon Trail from Salt Lake City to Los Angeles and to uh, establish farms outside of Los Angeles uh, supposedly saw in Joshua trees the uh, silhouette of the prophet Joshua pointing the way towards the promised land. And I don't know, I found this picture of Joshua uh, online somewhere. So I don't know, that, that, that copyright thing I signed a minute ago. Um, but it, it, I don't know, it actually kind of looks like it to me. Um, and you can imagine that this arm right here is Joshua's arm pointing out like this. I don't know. Um, so, oh, okay, I forgot and I put this in. Um, another just interesting little tidbit about Joshua trees, which maybe we'll get to again at the end, we'll see. Um, there's some evidence actually that Joshua trees may uh, have evolved to have a special relationship with something called a Shasta ground sloth. So uh, 20,000 years ago here in North America, there were all kinds of really amazing, awesome animals that aren't around anymore. Mastodons and native horses. We had something called a dire wolf that lived here. Amongst the, there was a native camel. Also, there was something called a ground sloth, which, uh, is a sloth. Um, this sloth actually, this is a reconstruction, was pretty big. Um, if he stood up on his four legs, he'd probably be about eight to 12 feet tall. 
Um, and, and I think this is so incredibly awesome, um, it turns out the desert is a really good place for preserving things. Stuff mummifies really easily. And in Grand Canyon National Park, there's a place called Rampart Cave. And inside Rampart Cave, you can find dried out, preserved, mummified fossil, uh, not fossil, uh, sloth poops. There's one of them. I really, really want to get a hold of one of these. <laughs> okay, so someone did get a hold of these, and they broke them open. And inside those poops, they found Joshua tree leaves. This is an actual leaf from an actual Joshua tree that was eaten by a giant sloth. Also, inside those poops, they sometimes find Joshua tree fruits and Joshua tree seeds. And so some people have argued, and it's possible, that sloths were this important um, seed disperser for yuccas, that the sloths would go and eat the seeds and then and because you can find the seeds intact in their poop, that maybe this was like, you know, like birds eating the mistletoe, same kind of thing, but with a giant sloth. Who knows? Okay, so lots of cool stuff about Joshua trees. Um, but the reason that I'm interested in them actually has nothing to do with Mormon settlers or John C. Fremont or even sloths, really. The reason I'm interested in them is because of pollination, you could have guessed. Um, and it turns out that Joshua trees, actually like all yuccas, so Joshua tree, um, they, and we'll get to this in a second, but in the past we've recognized this as the species yucca brevifolia. Brevifolia means short leaves. Like all yuccas, Joshua trees are pollinated exclusively by insects called yucca moths. Um, yuccas make almost no nectar at all, and they actually make very little pollen, so relative to just about any other flowering plant out there, their pollen production is really, really low. And so it would seem like there's not a lot to offer a pollinator. Why bother? Um, and these yucca moths, they only ever associate with yuccas. They don't go to any other plants. And typically, not always, but typically, each species of yucca has one species of yucca moth associated with it. It gets so much better. <laughs> okay, it gets so much better. So, to think about why this is better, um, why this is cooler, imagine for a minute that you're watching a bee going to a sunflower. Okay. The bee is there and it's kind of blundering around and it kind of brushes up against the right part of the flower and maybe it gets some pollen on its fur. It's not really fur, but um, that bee is really there because it wants either to drink nectar, or maybe eat pollen. It could really care less about pollinating the flower. Sometimes flowers will come up with ways of trying to trick plants into doing the business. So like when we talked about the um, hawk moth and the Darwin's orchid earlier, you saw like that nectar spur was basically like a way of manipulating the moth into doing the job of pollinating. The moth didn't seem like it really wanted to. Yucca moths are really different. Yucca moths have this very stereotyped, so they do the same thing every time, behavior. And it sure looks like they're pollinating on purpose. And I have a little video of this. This video, by the way, was shot by a Willamette undergrad. And let's see if it'll play. Please play. Yep, okay. So what you're looking at here, this is a petal of a Joshua tree flower. This is another petal. Right here, that's called the stigma. That's where the pollen needs to go. Under the moth's head here, she has a ball of pollen that she's collected and kind of squished on there. The pollen's kind of sticky. She's now taking these things. The technical name for those are is tentacles. I kid you not. She's taking those tentacles and she's uncurling them and she has some pollen that she's holding in the tip of that tentacle. And now she's putting it right onto the stigma, right onto the place where the pollen needs to go. Also, those tentacles no other insects have those. Which, for an evolutionary biologist, that is super weird. So, um, this is kinda under the hood a little bit inside baseball, but um, evolutionary biologists talk about something called homology, which basically the idea is if we look at different animals, they have equivalent organs. So if we look at my giant dog, Sam, and we look at his front legs, he's got two bones right up here in his front limb, just a radius and an ulna, just like I do because 
it's the same bone, just put to different feature, different uses. Not true with tentacles. There are no other insects that have anything even equivalent to this. This would be like discovering some species of dog in South America that has like an extra set of legs coming out of the middle of its body. Really, really weird. And as far as we can tell, all those tentacles do is hold and manipulate pollen. Awesome. <laughs> okay, so as I said earlier, I don't know what's going through a moth's mind. I have no idea. But to me, it sure looks like she's doing that on purpose. And there's actually a really good reason that she should do it on purpose. And that reason is so. This actually is the second act. Right before that, what she did was this. Okay, can you guys see how she's kind of moving her butt back and forth there? What she's doing there is coming out of the end of her butt is a little stinger-like thing. It's actually called an ovipositor. What that means is just egg layer. Ova is egg. And she's using, I'm gonna go back and play that again. She's using her ovipositor to cut into the top part of the flower, uh, something called the, uh, the style, and she's laying her eggs in there. Those eggs are gonna hatch into some caterpillars, and as the flower starts to develop into a fruit, here's a cross section through a fruit, each one of these little white things, that's a seed. Her caterpillars are gonna eat the seeds. In fact, the only thing that her caterpillars can eat are Joshua tree seeds. And remember, there are no other pollinators out there. So if she doesn't do the work of pollinating, no food for baby. Does that make sense? Um, so on the face of it, it seems like it's this really nice exchange where the Joshua tree gets this really, really reliable pollination where the moth is gonna take pollen directly to where it needs to go and put it there on purpose. And the uh, moth gets this really highly nutritious, so seeds are full of protein and fat and starch, really nutritious food for her babies. Seems really awesome. Um, her babies are gonna eat some, but usually not all of the seeds. Um, and so uh, in their natural habit of a glad uh, plastic container, um, eventually out of that fruit, come some just adorable little caterpillars. Um, they're very, very pathetic. Um, they're common these, I think of them as kind of preppy pink and green. Um, and they, uh, in nature, are gonna uh, come out of the fruit and then fall to the ground and then immediately dig into the soil and they form a cocoon. And they'll stay in that cocoon for at least a year. In other yuccas, we know that they sometimes stay in their cocoons for 10 years. We don't know how they know that it's time to come out of the soil. We have no idea, well, I have some ideas, but we don't really know. Um, but they do, when the flower, the next time the Joshua tree starts to flower, they um, metamorphose into adults and then come out of the soil and the process starts over again. Yeah. So we're coming up on 11.15 and so shortly I wanna uh, have some questions and then take a break. Um, but the last thing I'm gonna say before the break is a, men a moment ago I mentioned that this seems like it's this beautiful, happy relationship where it's the balance of nature and all that kind of thing. And I'm kind of a pessimistic guy. And I actually think that maybe it's not as harmonious as it seems. So on the one hand, the Joshua tree is getting a good deal. They live in the desert, they don't have to make any nectar, nectar is expensive, it requires sugar, it requires a lot of water. But on the other hand, Joshua trees are not getting the greatest deal ever. Because really, what would be so much better is if they could have this great pollination and not lose any seeds. Remember, those seeds that get eaten, those are potential baby Joshua trees. And some of your babies are getting eaten by this moth don't like it, right? So it's like, it's like if I go to get my new Subaru and like, okay, I really, really like my Subaru, but I would like it so much more if they just gave it to me, <laughs> okay? 
Similarly, I mentioned earlier, um, the caterpillars eat some of the seeds, but not all of them. Um, and in fact, there's good evidence in other yuccas that if there are too many eggs in the flower, enough that potentially all the seeds are gonna get eaten, the plant will actually kill that flower and it drops off the, off the plant, killing the, the prospective seeds, but also killing the baby yucca moth larvae. And technically, in the literature, the name for that is adaptive abortion. So I think that maybe it's not as beautiful and happy as it seems, that maybe this is uh, a reduced antagonism that the two of them are, yes, they're getting a little bit, but they're both trying to get a better deal. Does that make sense? Okay. When we, uh, I'm going to take some questions and we'll take a break. Um, is that right? Questions and then break. Um, and when we come back, we'll talk about genetics. Hi, my, my name is Franca. My question is about bees. Um, are you, will you take that? question? All right, I will so happily the question take a is, question about bees. <laughs> I don't necessarily know as much about bees as I do about Joshua trees, but I'm happy to take that question. Okay, so uh, as pollinators, uh, if the bee should become extinct here in North America, uh, is there some other insect that is coming up behind them? So when we talk about, um, so this is a more general question, but when we talk about bees and the loss of bees, which is a very serious problem, at the moment. Hidden inside that, there's actually two different issues. One is the loss of native bees. So there are many, many species of bee that are native to North America and often are specialized on native plants. And, for, and, and we're losing native bees at an alarming rate. For native plants and native bees, when we lose those, we're done. Those plants are I mean, maybe they can recruit other pollinators. Some things are, are generalist pollinated, but that's bad news in general for diversity in North America. The other issue that we talk about when we're talking about loss of bees is the honeybee. Honeybees are actually not native to North America. They're introduced from Europe. Um, and interestingly, by the way, European honeybees are introduced from Africa, but the European honeybees were uh, domesticated and they've lost some of their natural aggression. European honeybees are kind of a double-edged sword because on the one hand, they actually have taken over the responsibility, if you want, of pollinating some native plants as native bees have gone extinct. On the other hand, European honeybees are part of the reason that native bees are going extinct. There's then also a separate, you know, a third issue that with, for honeybees, a lot of our agriculture depends on honeybees to work. So almonds, for example, are pollinated by European honeybees. And as we, there's this uh, phenomenon called colony collapse disorder, where honeybees uh, are dying out, like whole hives are disappearing, which now is increasing evidence that that's linked to pesticide use. Um, that cr has a real economic challenge. And is there something else that could come along? I suppose we could try to take Africanized bees and breed them to be resistant to uh, pesticide, but in the short term, no, no. It's, it's a big problem. I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah. Um, right there. This is Peter. While the lady Yakamoth is doing all of this, what is the gentleman Yakamoth doing? apart from inseminating the ladies? So uh, this is a question about, about males. And as in many species, males are rather superfluous. <laughs> um, male moths do not pollinate. They do not lay eggs. The only thing that they do is run around frantically looking for lady yucca moths. And so a yucca moth is about the size of the tip of my index finger. They're really small, but I can recognize males from 20 yards away. 
because males are constantly running from flower to flower to flower to flower to flower. They're incredibly active. And when I go up to the flower to try to do something to it, maybe collect moths or maybe just look, immediately you'll see all these moths kind of running out of the flower and trying to go down into the leaves, which are really spiky. It's always the males that do that. The females just try to hide. Um, and and uh, my technician likens me to a male yucca moth because I'm constantly <laughs> doing this thing. Yeah. That's all I got. Hi. Jinx up here in the, on the side. Um, you know, I thought my kids were picky eaters. Holy macaroni. Um, I want to know, though, about those um, little eggs and the larva falling to the ground. How do you know that they've been, been there a year or 15 years? Somebody sitting there on a stool counting how many fall out of the tree? So the at least a year part, um, that's an educated guess, but I think it's probably right. And the reason is that Joshua Tree's flower once here. It is entirely possible that moths come out at the wrong time of year, and I'm just not around to see it. If they do that, though, they're doomed. The more than a year, there are two ways of suspecting that. One is, it turns out Joshua Trees don't necessarily flower every year like for example last year, which was a huge bummer. And so I think that the moths have to be able to somehow know no flowering this year and wait. The other way that we know that at least in some yucca moths, they can stay in, what's is called diapause. Diapause is essentially hibernation, if you want, for longer is uh, there was an entomologist named C.V. Riley, and he uh, had uh, some yucca moth larvae that he put into um, a uh, bucket of sand and they went down and made a little cocoon on his desk and he just left it sitting there for 10 years. <laughs> and then one day like, oh, there are moths in there. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, okay. Um, so I actually left out an another awesome little Darwin thing. Um, so Darwin actually knew about yucca moths. Um, he read about them, um, and uh, he got Riley to send him some cocoons. Um, and in a famous letter, he writes again to J.D. Hooker. He's like, hey, I got these cocoons from this guy in the US, but I don't have any yuccas, and maybe you have some at the botanical garden, but have you read about this? And he says, it's the most wonderful case of fertilization ever described which makes a great quote to put in grant proposals. Yeah. I promised this gentleman. Yeah, but I have the microphone. I can. <laughs> I, apparently I'm breaking the rules. Can, can we pass to him next, please? Yeah. yeah we're rules here. Okay. Uh, my name's Ken. And it seems like it's a little bit dangerous for a plant species to rely on one type of insect for pollination and maybe dangerous for the insect to rely on one plant. It seems like, a, is it more likely for generalization for more plants to rely on different types of insects and vice versa? Awesome question. Um, there is an idea in evolution in general, not just for pollinators, that specialization is a dead end, that things that specialize might be more likely to go extinct. And I absolutely agree with you. Seems like this is a bad idea. I have two answers, I guess. The first answer, and something that is really important to me personally as an evolutionary biologist, and I really try to emphasize in my classes, Evolution is not a designer. Evolution is not thinking ahead. Evolution is thinking about what is good enough right now. And often the solutions that evolution devises are kind of dumb. Um, and it is entirely possible that being specialized is really good in the short term. You got this really great pollinator and you don't have to make a lot of nectar for them, but in the long term, bad idea. 
The other answer I have is people have tried very hard to look at this question of is specialization a dead end? And what I, which basically is to say, when specialists arise, when specialists evolve, do they stick around for a long period of time? And the studies are contradictory. Some of them suggest that indeed specialization is tippy, so we see it arise and then go extinct. The only specialists we see out there are relatively evolutionarily new. Other studies contradict that. Um, in, with respect to yuccas and yucca moss particular, um, work that I'm doing now suggests that actually yuccas are fairly young in the scheme of things, about four million years old. But there are other kinds of plants that have something very similar going on, figs and fig wasps, for example. Do you guys know when you eat a fig newton, you're actually eating wasp eggs? Yep. Um, and figs have been around for a long time. Yep. Figs have been around for a long, long time, at least, at least 30 million years. So right there, contradictory. On the one hand, it seems like yuccas are kind of new-ish. Figs that do basically the same thing, old. Great question. Is, um, I've read somewhere that, that uh, weeds, the invasive species of weeds, which I seem to have many of in my garden, so this is a practical question. Uh, I know some of them will wait for a long period of time before they come up, which makes it particularly difficult if you're a gardener. Uh, and I know some will wait up to seven years. They, they, they'll wait for the most ideal, I guess, climatic conditions before they'll show themselves. Um, could you speak a little bit to this process? So. When you're talking about weeds waiting, usually, not always, what we're talking about is seeds, things that are, you have a seed bank established, and the seeds germinate when it's right. And the way that that is comparable to what we just talked about is that in both of these cases, both seeds of some annual weed and yucca moths waiting around the soil, is these are adaptations, ostensibly, to variable environments. And if your environment is not constant, and the desert really is dominated by ephemeral resources, even in the rainy season, it may not rain for a year. And when it does rain, the rain comes all at once in one spot. And you want to be able to take advantage of that perfect moment and do all your business and then be done and wait. Both the seed bank you're talking about and this diapause, the fact that moths can wait in the soil for decades, are ways of dealing with that variable environment, having some way of going into some resting stage and staying there. Yeah, uh, this is George. Um, all the yucca seeds aren't eaten. How are the, the ones that aren't eaten, how are they distributed? What? Okay, awesome question. So as I mentioned earlier, one idea that's out there is that um, Joshua trees are meant are specialized for being dispersed by these sloths that are not around anymore. I will say I don't, I'm not persuaded yet. It is definitely true that at least one sloth so at some point in time definitely ate a Josh tree fruit because we have found a poop that has fruit in it. That doesn't necessarily mean that the sloths were the thing, right? Like, just like I'm not necessarily the primary disperser for blueberries, but I do eat them sometimes. And if I'm, in, you know, out in the woods, I guess. Okay. Um, we definitely also know that there are lots of other things that disperse seeds. One of the really big ones is something called a pack rat. Um, if you're from the West, in the inland West, you've experienced pack rats. I had them living inside my car when I was 16. Um, what they do is go out and grab stuff and take it back to this big nest and often forget about it. Um, and they do a lot of caching of seeds. Um, there's also something called an antelope ground squirrel that very, very commonly we see up eating the seeds and the fruit and the flowers. Um, birds will disperse them. Uh, my colleague uh, at the US Geological Survey in Nevada has pictures of coyotes carrying around Joshua tree fruits. So other animals are dispersing them. 
<clears throat> Excuse me. My name is uh, David. Uh, some plants trap and consume insects. How do, how do, how do they propagate uh, using insects? Do you, do you know anything about that? I'm thinking. <laughs> so I think you're thinking about like a sundew or a Venus flytrap. And I'm going to say off the top of my head, I don't know what their pollination system is. My guess is that they're actually generalist pollinated. I could be wrong. And because I feel like I have an unsatisfactory answer to you, I'm going to step over here and say something un irrelevant. Uh, <laughs> say I, I really could run for office. Um, uh, often those um, carnivorous plants are growing in nutrient poor soils, typically places where there's very little nitrogen, bogs, for example, and they're supplementing their nutrition with proteins that are in the insects. Um, and that being restricted to a very specialized environment, that n often makes me think generalist, not necessarily, but so I would suspect that they're being pollinated by generalized bees, but I'm really not sure, I'm, I'm, I apologize. Okay, this is an amazing session. We look forward to coming back in 10 minutes. Thanks. Okay, thanks everybody. Welcome back to part two. Um, so I'm gonna start this section, I think maybe with an apology, in that <laughs> whereas the last, the first half of the lecture was uh, full of videos and pictures of organisms and fun stories, this part I'm afraid is a bit more abstract. <laughs> Um, and it even has a little math in it. Uh, yeah, um, I, yeah. And all I can tell you is that uh, this is the way of biology these days. It is getting kind of abstract. And a lot of what I have to talk to you about is genetics. Um, but I'm hoping that maybe I can at least get you to a place where you think, eh, well, that's interesting, um, if maybe abstract. Um, and the thing I'm going to talk to you about today is something called the Joshua Tree Genome Project. And real quick, has anybody heard of the Human Genome Project before? Raise your hands. Okay. Uh, does anybody know what the Human Genome Project is? So, so the, the Human Genome Project was actually finished in my first year of graduate school. So it's a ways back now. Um, and the task of the Genome Project was to look at all of the DNA in one person. Um, we actually don't know who that one person is. There's some speculation that it may have been the head of the NIH. We know that he was a man and that he was European. Um, so that was quite a while ago. At the time that that project was done, it took about 10 years and the US government spent about $3 billion on it. Uh, these days, technology has come a long way. And we're trying to do the same thing for Joshua Trees. We do not plan to spend $3 billion. <laughs> and we're really hoping not to spend 10 years doing it. Um, in fact, we've done the initial part. Uh, there's a lot more work to do, but we've done the initial part and it cost about mm, $3,000. And the Joshua Tree genome is every bit as big as the human genome. Um, so, what I'm going to tell you about for the next um, 45 minutes or so is about this project trying to do what we've done for humans for Joshua trees. Um, and although that sounds incredibly crazy and ambitious, and maybe in some ways it is, biology has changed so much since 2000 that really for most organisms these days, building a genome is kind of one of the first things you'd want to do is look at all of the genetics. Um, this, by the way, is a collaborative project. So I'm working on this with a bunch of other scientists, um, including uh, some conservation biologists at the US Geological Survey, uh, my friends uh, Todd and Leslie. Um, I'm also working with uh, some genome scientists at the University of Georgia, uh, Jim Liebensmack is uh, the director of, the, or excuse me, is the director of the Georgia Genomics Facility and is uh, 
full professor at the uh, University of Georgia Department of Plant Sciences. Uh, Mike McCain uh, was formerly Jim's PhD student. He's just started as a professor at the University of Alabama, Roll Tide. Um, Carlina, it looks like Carolina, but it's actually Carlina, um, is a postdoc working with Jim, so she's finished her PhD and is continuing on. Um, she works on something called gene expression, so figuring out when genes are turned on and how much. Um, so I say to my students, earlier in my life, I was not expressing very many genes for making hair on my front of my face, and I was expressing a lot more on the top of my head. Up here, the hair genes are turned off, and down here, they're turned on. That's the kind of thing that she studies, but in, in plants. Um, and lastly, uh, my good buddy Jeremy. Uh, Jeremy was a graduate student in the lab where I was a postdoc. Jeremy has just started a faculty position at Cal State Northridge, so just a half an hour from Joshua Trees. Um, and Jeremy is also our web guru and social media maven. Um, and so. Uh, this project is also um, a collaboration between a bunch of different organizations that are variously interested in Joshua Trees, uh, including the Joshua Tree, Joshua Tree National Park Association, uh, a small conservation group from uh, Arizona called Friends of the Joshua Tree Forest, uh, the Missouri Botanical Garden, who they were very excited about this because uh, one of their early curators uh, wrote some of the initial descriptions of yuccas. Um, California native plants. Uh, some of you may know that I, I pulled a bait, or I, I did something terrible to Anne and asked to reschedule this at the last minute. And the reason is next week I'm going to be at the Cal Native Plants meeting, uh, working with some of their uh, uh, regional leads on developing a citizen science program. Um, and I especially actually want to thank a group called the Living Desert, which is a botanical garden and zoo uh, in. Uh, not Palm Springs, uh, Palm Desert, Palm Desert, California. Um, and they actually gave us a very generous gift to work on the Joshua Tree Genome Project. Uh, and also, I want to thank uh, about 300 people. So to start this, to get this project off the ground, we actually initially used a crowdfunding model. So you guys might have heard of like, um, uh, Indiegogo or GoFundMe or things like that. Experiment is a crowdfunding platform for science. Um, and we raised uh, almost $1,100 from individual donors uh, to work on the Josh Tree Genome Project. The average donation was 20 bucks. So, yeah. Okay, so to take a really big step back, have you heard of DNA? <laughs> Okay, so um, the genome is composed of DNA. Uh, all of us uh, have DNA in every cell in our body, and every cell contains the code of life or the instructions for making a human being. Fundamentally, what it is is just a long chain of molecules composed of something called nucleotides. Um, these are them. You've heard of A's, C's, G's, and T's before. I think I'm looking carefully at our resident genetics expert. <laughs> um, and, and some parts of DNA contain instructions for making genes, for making proteins that actually do stuff in our bodies. So uh, hair, for example, is made up of protein. Our fingernails are made up of protein. Proteins also can, uh, can make what are called enzymes. So uh, these days, you know, after when I get ready for my cereal in the morning, I take a little enzyme that has it's called lactate, uh, which is something that digests milk. Um, that's a protein. Um, so DNA contains instructions for making proteins, amongst other things. DNA contains instructions for making all the stuff that makes us us. Um, every cell contains a complete genome. So the genome is the complete set of DNA. All of the genes, all of the not genes, it turns out that a very large fraction of the genome is stuff that, as far as we can tell, doesn't really do anything. There's a very strong debate about whether or not that stuff that we don't know what it does actually does something really important that we don't know about, or whether it's just there along for the ride. Um, so we call that non-coding DNA. Sequencing the genome involves looking at all of it. Um, by the way, um, 
at the beginning, I asked you if you'd heard about the human genome, and we're working on the Joshua Tree genome. That's actually technically a little bit of a misnomer, because there isn't a human genome. There are seven billion human genomes. Every human genome is a little different, one from another. And potentially, those differences, you know, they might be unimportant little details, or they could be potentially really interesting. And potentially, by looking at the differences, we might be able to find out some important things. So we might be able to, for example, find out what causes Parkinson's disease. Um, I recently had my genome sequenced, and I find out that I carry a gene that is associated with increased risks of Parkinson's disease. Um, or we might be able to find out the history of human species. We're trying to use that same kind of approach to learn about the biology of Joshua trees. So a little abstract, but does the general idea make some sense at this point? Yeah? Okay. Um, so as I said, each, here's a section of the Joshua tree genome, a very small section. Um, this is actually from the chloroplast. And each tree, each individual tree that we look at, their genome is a little different. So for example, here's 11 trees. And what you can see is that some of them at this position, this nucleotide, some of them have an A there, and some of them have a C. And those differences, they might be totally unimportant, or they might be useful to us in some different ways. One of the things that the genome is potentially helpful for is um, identifying genes that cause differences between trees. So here's two Joshua trees. This one's really short and stubby. This one's really tall. Maybe we could figure out what genes are involved in causing that difference in trunk height, and you're going to hear a lot more about that in a minute. Also, potentially, the genome might be able to tell us about the history of Joshua trees. So for example, here are a bunch of different species of closely related plants. That guy up at the top, that's a Joshua tree, Yucca brevifolia. Right here, this is something called the Mojave yucca, or yucca shedidra. People know what that is? It's an agave. It's yes, it's agave tequiliana. It's what we make tequila out of. This thing out down here, that's something called hespro yucca. For a long time, people actually thought it was a kind of yucca. We've learned recently that it's actually something different. Also pollinated by yucca moths, by the way. It's an independent origin of yucca moth pollination. Okay. So if we were to look at a section of the genome for these organisms, what we can see is that overall, the genomes are actually really similar in this section. But right here, there's an A in some of them and a T in the others. And in fact, if you look a little closely, the ones that have A are all Joshua trees. And what that suggests to us is actually Joshua trees are all more closely related to each other than they are to yuccas. And at some point, prior to the common ancestor of all yuccas, there was a mutation from T to A, and that mutation has now been inherited in all the descendants, right? So by analogy, um, back in, when would that have been, 1820, one of my ancestors moved from Ireland to North America, Canada, actually, all of the descendants now have inherited that characteristic. All of us live in North America. Comparably, at some point in the past, some yucca evolved an A instead of a T at that position, and all of the descendants now share that. Does that make sense? Similarly, if we look at another place in the genome, you can see that some plants have G and some have A. And if you look carefully, it's actually all of the yuccas that have G at that position. And these other things, um, agave and hespero yucca, have an A at that position. And so what that tells us is that yuccas are all more cl closely related to each other. They share a more recent common ancestor with one another than any of them does with the tequila agave. And by iterating that, by looking at lots and lots and lots of different places in the genome, 
we can actually start to build an evolutionary tree. So this tree that you're looking at here, that's an, based on an analysis of about 100,000 nucleotides of data. Um, and what it tells us is that yuccas are closely related to another group of plants that includes the agaves, um, and they're in a family called the agavaceae um, that includes hosta. People have, lots of people grow hosta around here. It's a really common ornamental plant, you know, really nice white flowers. So one thing we can learn from studying the genome is about evolutionary history. Yeah. Um, okay, so our best estimate is that the Joshua tree genome is about three billion nucleotides in length. That's about the same size as the human genome. Um, and at this point, um, that's a lot of data. <laughs> um, so far, um, we have actually generated 105 billion nucleotides of data. So we've actually, using that initial startup money that we generated from experiment.com, we've read the Joshua Tree genome about 35 times over. Um, and that sounds really good, right? Um, technically, we'd like to be closer to like 50 times over, but that seems really good. The problem is that those 105, or 150 billion, what did I say? 105 billion nucleotides, they come in little 150 nucleotide chunks. So this would be the equivalent of taking, say, the complete works of Shakespeare and getting 35 copies of it and then putting all of those through a shredder and then taking each of the little tiny tidbits and trying to figure out Macbeth from that. Not easy. And it's especially hard because if you come along and you see a little section of text that says something is rotten in, you're, and then you pick up another one and it also says rotten in the state of Denmark, you're not sure. Do those two pieces go together? Are those multiple copies of the same passage from Hamlet? Or maybe does Shakespeare say rotten in the, his works a lot? D does that make sense? Because we've got each of them 35 times over, which on the one hand is good because we can know that, okay, it wasn't just a typo in this one edition of Shakespeare where it's, he spelled rotten with a Q or something. Um, but on the other hand, it makes it a lot harder because we don't know, do the, are this, is this is the same thing or not? Is my metaphor working, kind of? Okay, so our task now is to take this pile of little tiny pieces of paper, they're actually little bits of data, but whatever, and try to stitch them together to figure out the entire thing. And it turns out that's really hard. <laughs> I'm not doing it by hand. We have computers working on it. Um, uh, until probably tomorrow when my new colleague is gonna get her computer set up, I have the most powerful computer on the entire Willamette campus. My computer cannot handle this problem. Um, this analysis uh, is being done at the University of Georgia where they have supercomputers and it turns out it's pretty hard for them too. But I'm gonna say that despite the challenge of this, we've actually made some decent progress. Um, so this thing I was talking about are trying to put all these little bits together, that's something called genome assembly. Um, these days, if you're a computer scientist, uh, hey, am I doing a good job of kissing the mic? Should I kiss like this? Yeah, okay. These days, if you're a computer scientist, genome assembly is one of the really big problems out there that people are working on. And part of the reason it's a big challenge is because of this. Because you get these little 150 base pair snippets instead of an entire section of Hamlet at once. Um, but I'm gonna argue that despite the fact that it's really hard and it's taking a long time, I think we've made some good progress. So, so far we've assembled about 150,000 bases into one long section. It turns out that 150,000 bases come from something called the chloroplast. Doesn't matter if you don't know what the chloroplast is, but basically it's the part of a plant cell that's involved in doing photosynthesis. It has its own genome. Um, we've assembled uh, the chloroplast for about 40 different individual Joshua trees. 
And so you might think about this as like having recovered the sonnets from Shakespeare. It's not Shakespeare's complete works, but potentially we can learn a lot about how Shakespeare wrote and what he thought about by looking at the sonnets. Does that make sense? In addition, um, we've done something called rad seek. Don't worry about what rad is. It's not rad as in radical. It actually stands for restriction associated DNA. Doesn't matter. Um, and using rad seek, we have sequenced about 49,000 genes uh, from 165 different Joshua trees. So again, going back to my Shakespeare analogy, you might imagine this as being like having the first few lines of act one, scene one, from each play of Shakespeare. Again, not as good as reading all of Hamlet, but if you're just interested in finding out about what Shakespeare wrote like and what his topics were and you know how he used language, potentially helpful. Does that make sense? So what I'm gonna talk about for the remainder of our time, and again, I'm gonna apologize because this is just gonna get abstract, is about some of the things that we have been able to learn just by looking at this. So the data we have right now, both the chloroplast and that rad data, it's only about six one hundredths of one percent of the entire genome. The entire genome is three billion bases, but I think it's pretty good, and we're getting some really interesting results. Okay. So uh, I have more to tell you about than I possibly can do today. I'm going to try to hit the important points. Some of the things I'm going to try to talk about in the remaining time are how old are Joshua trees? How long have Joshua trees been around on Earth? How many species of Joshua tree are there? It turns out there may be more than one. There's one hiding in plain sight. And what can Joshua trees tell us about Darwin's abominable mystery? Can Joshua trees tell us about whether pollination is important in making new species of plants? Cool? Yeah. Okay. So the first one, this how old are Joshua trees? I'm going to go over this fairly briefly. It's, there's not a huge amount to say. but um, So this is work that I've been uh, doing in collaboration with Mike McCain, uh, who I mentioned has just started at University of Alabama. Um, and uh, this is work actually that started as a Willamette senior thesis. Um, and we're working on putting together a paper describing this now. There's a, just a couple little boxes I have to check just again to make sure that everything's looking good. Um, and this is based on an analysis of that chloroplast sequence data. So again, I told you guys a minute ago, we could think about that as like looking at the sonnets to study Shakespeare. Um, and what we've done is we've sequenced um, the chloroplast genome from about 40 different individual Joshua trees as well as a bunch of other closely related species. So other yuccas, that Mojave yucca I showed you earlier, or the uh, tequila agave. And what we've done is we built an evolutionary tree, so showing uh, re relationships among species. You might think about this as being comparable to a family tree, but just looking at your mom's side. Um, and, and what we see is that all the Joshua trees are more closely related to each other than anything else. So um, just like uh, my sisters and my brothers are all more closely related to each other than either of us is to our first cousin. Um, and all the yuccas go together, and then there are these other things. We've also used some additional information, something called a molecular clock. All this means is by using some fossils, we can try to estimate, for example, how old was the common ancestor of yuccas and agaves, and then from that we can extrapolate other information. Um, it turns out that we're really lucky that there is a fossil, something called Proto-Yucca shedesii. Uh, it was found uh, in central Nevada. Um, here's the fossil. This is a cross-section through a trunk, and I'm not a wood anatomist, but apparently if you study wood, yuccas have weird wood, and the anatomists look at that and they're like, oh yeah, definitely a yucca. I take their word for it. I will admit, like, yep, that looks like the inside of a Joshua tree to me, but what do I know? Um, and they can date that using some radioisotopes, 
to about 14 and a half million years ago. And we think that that fits right there on the tree. So we can say this common ancestor right here has to be at least 14 million years old. Could be older, but at least 14 million years. Um, and when we do that and put it into the computer, what we find is that yuccas overall are actually fairly young from an evolutionary perspective, um, about four and a half million years ago. So still, seems like a long time to me. Um, this two-hour lecture is dragging on, 14, <laughs> four million years. Um, but for context, uh, humans shared a common ancestor with chimpanzees about six and a half million years ago. So relative to, for example, the apes, yuccas are pretty young. And the common ancestor of all Joshua trees was about 750,000 years ago. Um, so uh, again, humans shared a common ancestor with Neanderthals about 400,000 years ago. So in the scheme of things, although Joshua trees may look like they're some ancient prehistoric thing from another world, they're actually pretty new. So I've hit you a lot with abstraction and DNA and phylogenetic trees, so I'm going to try to reel this back into some human-oriented things for just a second. Um, this person uh, is a woman named Susan Delano McKelvey. Yes, that Delano. She was first cousin of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Um, and it appears, based upon my quick rereading of her biography in Wikipedia this morning, um, that she had a rather scandalous and embarrassing divorce. Uh, I gather that her husband was quite abusive and she fled her uh, home in New York to go live in Boston. And then uh, living in Boston, um, she was trying to sort of restart, restart her life and find something that would give her meaning and also give her some respectability. I mean, can you imagine a Delano, a divorcee? Um, and what she decided to do was to go work at Arnold Arboretum, which is the Arboretum associated with Harvard University. Uh, apparently, at first, they gave her a job of washing pots. But eventually, uh, she actually went on to become a quite accomplished botanist. And one of the things that she did was to uh, write a monograph, so an extensive study of the yuccas of North America. Um, and I have a copy of McKelvey's Yuccas of the American Southwest in my office. And I look at it fairly frequently. Here's a picture of her standing, actually not with a yucca, that's something called a Dazzlerian, but this is on her uh, expedition across the American Southwest. And if we look back at Delano's monograph, she talks about Joshua trees. And she points out something, which is that Joshua trees in different parts of the desert actually look kind of different from one another. So if we go into the western Mojave, so west of Death Valley, Joshua trees west of Death Valley tend to be kind of tall. They've got this long trunk. Joshua trees east of Death Valley tend to be short, and they look sort of more bush-like. Joshua trees west of Death Valley tend to be skinny. They don't have very many branches. Joshua trees east of Death Valley tend to be bushier. And they also differ in the length of the leaves. Joshua trees west of Death Valley tend to have long leaves. Um, somewhat frustratingly, because of how taxonomy works, this one on the left is called Yucca brevifolia variety brevifolia, which means the yucca with the short leaves, the variety with the short leaves, but actually it's the one with the long leaves. <laughs> And uh, McKelvey said, this thing east of Death Valley, I think that's a variety. And she named it after another botanist named Jaeger, and she calls this Jaeger's Joshua tree. Sometimes you'll also see this called the pygmy Joshua tree or the dwarf Joshua tree, because they're small. Um, so that was in the 1930s. Uh, more recently, this guy, a Swedish scientist named Ulle Pelmir, uh, and the first time he ever spoke to me on the phone, he said, May I speak to Chris Smith, please? And I said, speaking, he said, oh, hi, this is Ulla Pelmir. And <laughs> uh, Ulla was my postdoctoral advisor. Uh, and at the time I worked for him, he was at the University of Idaho. Before that, he was at Vanderbilt. Um, and Ulla's interest 
was in moths. Um, Ulla started out as a Swedish kid um, collecting stamps, and apparently that became just too like charismatic and accessible for him, and so he decided instead to spend the rest of his life studying tiny, uh, unattractive, uninteresting looking moths. He was a specialist in the micro lepidoptera, so you know, lots of us know about butterflies and things like that. No, Ulla was interested in the small gray ones. Um, and he uh, looked at moths that pollinate Joshua trees. In the past, it was thought that there was one species of moth, I told you guys, one moth per species, per yucca species, right? Um, and that moth was called Tegeticula, don't worry about that, Synthetica. Because Ulla looked, he's like, you know what, the one, some of these moths are a lot smaller than the others. And he also went and looked at their genitalia, which if you're an entomologist, that's what you're into, is looking at bug penises. Um, and it turns out that the small moths also have different genitalia. And also the small moths only occur in the eastern Mojave. Ulla then went and looked at their DNA. And actually, they're genetically different. And he said, you know what? I think that these are distinct species. I'm going to name a new species. The old one was called Tegeticula synthetica. Because the idea that there could be two species of moth associated with one type of plant was positively antithetical, he named the new one Tegeticula antithetica. And if you're Swedish and you study moths, that's just the funniest thing you've ever thought of. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, one of the last things that Ulla did, uh, Ulla passed away recently, um, one of his last scientific works was a new species of yucca moth that occurs on yucca shidra, and he named that moth Paradoxus shididgeridu. Which <laughs> okay. Okay, so just to connect us back to what the heck we're talking about. So we got these two varieties of Joshua tree. Ulla says, you know what, um, there's actually two kinds of moth. Um, and it turns out that one of my first jobs when I went to go work for Ulla was to drive around through the desert and go to all the places where Joshua trees occur. This kind of uh, lovely like camo green, that's where the Joshua trees grow. And to go to all those spots and collect moths. And what I discovered was that all of the places where McKelvey's yucca brevifolia, variety brevifolia, so the short leaf yucca with the short leaves that actually has long leaves, all the places where it grows, we found Tegeticula synthetica. And all the places where Jaeger's yucca grows, the pygmy yucca, we found Tegeticula anathetica. So actually what it looked like was we now have two species of moth with this restricted geographic distribution and two species of, or two varieties of yucca that are associated with them. Um, around that time also, uh, this guy uh, named Lee Lentz, who is uh, the, curator of the Rancho Santa Ana Botanical uh, Gardens in <laughs> Claremont, California. Um, he looked at Joshua Tree's flowers, and he was like, you know what? The flowers are really different, too. And Lee said, I, in my opinion, as a botanist, I think that these are actually different, not varieties, like McKelvey said, I think these are different species, okay? So um, I have a lot of respect for Lee but I differ with Lee in when I'm ready to call things different species. To me, I want to know not just do they look different from one another, I want to know can they interbreed? And are they becoming genetically differentiated because of interbreeding? And so we thought this might be a great place where we could use some of the genome data to try to ask that question. Are these things actually interbreeding so infrequently that they're becoming genetically differentiated? Yeah. Okay, so to look at that question, we went to the RADSeq data. Again, doesn't matter what that means. You can think about this as the like act one, scene one of each uh, section of Hamlet. We have about 49,000 genes. And um, we started out and we tried to ask the data, how many populations of Joshua trees are there? So we're gonna give you this data and we want you to organize it into some way so that each of these populations look like they go together, try one population, try two, try three, and computer tell us which one is best, which one looks to you like it makes the most sense. When we do that, 
So on the y-axis here, this is just a uh, statistical measure of how well the model, in this case how many populations there are, fit the data. Big numbers mean good, small numbers mean bad. Okay? And what we see is that th the goodest, the best way of fitting the data is to have two populations. Two is way better than one, three is terrible, four is terrible, five is terrible. The data are saying to us very strongly there are two things here. The next thing we did was to say, okay, computer, here's data from each of these individual Joshua trees. I want you to take each of them and tell me, do they go in population one or population two? So here's what those data look like, to so just orient you to this. Each one of these bars, that's one individual tree. And the height of either blue or green is telling us what is the probability that that tree is either population one in blue or population two in green. So this particular tree, it has about a 90% chance of belonging to population one. This tree right here, it has about a 100% chance of belonging to population two. And just looking at this little snapshot, there's a couple that look like mm, maybe we're uncertain, but for the most part, the trees are either definitely population one or definitely population two. That on its own is starting to say to us, you know what, there probably are, is not like interbreeding happening here. There's actually probably two different things. D does that sort of make sense? Okay. S sort of, yeah. So, so basically, we've taken data and we've asked the computer, put these, comp organize these, these individual trees based upon their genes into a number of populations and tell us for each tree, is it population one or is it population two or you can't tell. Most of the time, it doesn't say, I can't tell. It says, nope, definitely population one or definitely population two. Okay, so I'm gonna take this same kind of graph and I'm gonna blow it up and show you looking across all the desert. And here's what we see. So here's that same kind of chart with a bunch of, there's actually 22 individual bars here. Every single one of them, definitely population one. That's from this site right here. That's actually Joshua Tree National Park. Here, eight, that's in Arizona. There's 16 trees there. All of them, definitely population two. As we go across the desert, we see definitely population one, definitely population one, definitely population one. Over here, definitely population two, definitely population two, definitely population two, definitely population two. There's one place that's messed up, yeah? We're gonna talk a lot about that place that's messed up. That place that's messed up, uh, by the way, does this map look familiar? It's the same map that I showed you earlier where the moths occur. All of the ones that are associated with Synthetica genetically are population one or Brevifolia. All of the trees that are associated with uh, Anathetica are genetically population two or are Jigariana. So it looks like the data is starting to say to us, yep, there's two things here. But there's this one population right in the middle that's messed up. It turns out I spent a lot of time there. And that place right in the middle is uh, a site called Tickaboo Valley, right up in there. At Tickaboo Valley, we have, oh, okay, I thought I was into that picture. We have Yucca brevifolia and Yucca jigeriana growing right next to each other. In fact, that picture and that picture are uh, actually, this picture. <laughs> this is Yucca brevifolia and Yucca jigeriana growing right next to each other. Yeah? Okay. Also, Tickaboo Valley is really interesting for a number of other reasons, and I'm gonna not spoil this thunder by slipping over those. Okay, so at Tickaboo Valley, what we have is a population of Yucca brevifolia and a population of Yucca jigeriana and a place where they both occur. But that's just the tip of the iceberg in terms of interestingness about Tickaboo Valley. Also at Tickaboo Valley, running right through the middle of my study site, is the boundary of Nellis Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. in, yes, it's very inconvenient. <laughs> also, inside Nellis Air Force Base is a place called the Nevada Test Site. That's where they blew up all the nuclear bombs. I've been there 
I'm glad I don't work there. And between the Nevada test site and the boundary of Nellis Air Force Base, there is a place that officially does not exist. Until a year ago, the government denied that any place existed. And that place is called Area 51. Okay, so there is extensive disagreement about what is happening at Area 51. According to the government, at Area 51, they are testing uh, experimental aircraft, uh, including the stealth bomber and this thing that I don't remember what it's called. Um, that one, yep. Um, here's a picture of Area 51 that someone on the internet took from a mountain, nearby mountain range. Here are signs on the edge of Nellis Air Force Base, and if you look in really closely, those signs say, do not enter, use of lethal force authorized. Okay, that's what the government says. According to the internet, what is actually happening there <laughs> is aliens that were recovered from the crash at Roswell are being held captive and are being subject to extensive autopsies and vivisections, and U.S. leaders are staging high-level talks with delegations from a foreign star. I don't know what's actually happening there. But what I can tell you is that it makes it a really, really interesting place to do field work. Okay, no kidding. At times, when we're out working the desert, these guys in Jeeps that have no license plates on them, and the guys are in full camo, come and follow us around in the desert. Um, they seem to try to avoid being seen by us, but they're not very good at it. Also, occasionally, we have very, very, very low elevation flyovers of military jets. Um, pretty frequently, we find uh, casings for bullet casings, but they're like that big. Um, this is actually some actual aircraft wing wreckage that I found. Um, at night, I'm not kidding, at night, there are strange lights in the sky. I, I, there are things I've seen out there that I really, I have no idea what it is. Also, we frequently have visitors at the field site. Um, people who are there potentially looking to find out what's happening at Area 51. And we've had some interesting conversations with them. Um, there is one person who lives in Tigbu Valley, a guy named Steve Medlin. This is his mailbox. Uh, he got so tired of people coming and breaking into his mailbox and reading his mail that he had to put up this uh, highly reinforced metal mailbox. And when he did that, he made an extra little mailbox with a drop box where people could put letters to the alien. <laughs> I've read some of those letters. <laughs> They're really interesting. Okay. Um, and then there are some things that happen in Tickaboo Valley that are just completely inexplicable. Okay. I promise I'm going to wrap up shortly. Um, so, the other reason that it's really interesting is that we have these two tree varieties, species, living right next to each other. And, in fact, we've now genotyped, so we've gotten data from hundreds of trees in Tickaboo Valley, and what we found is that in most of the valley, it's just either Yucca brevifolia by itself, in blue, or Yucca jigariana. But in the middle, we have a mixture, both of the two trees and also trees that are hybrids. Which on the face of it, hybridization would seem to t say to us, no one species. But it's actually a little more nuanced than that. So uh, you may not be able to read it, but this scale here, this is two kilometers, so that's about a mile. This hybrid zone's about a mile wide. And what we've done is to look at how genetically different are trees from each other here versus here, so just a mile apart, but associated with different moths. Okay, here's we're getting into super technical. Um, I think Willamette student in the back, am I running out of time and you need to leave? No, he's just going, okay. Um, okay, uh, so to talk about that, I need to do one more level of abstraction. I need to talk about something called FST. FST is just a measure of genetic difference. How similar are two populations? Okay, FST goes from zero to one. An FST, uh, something is cut off. Okay, I want you to look at this site right here. You can see it's either A or G. 
in population one, it is 50% of the individuals have A and 50% have G. In population two, 50% of the individuals have A and 50% have G. Genetically, those two populations are identical to one another. They both have identical frequencies of A and G. There is no genetic difference between populations. There's genetic differences between individuals, but the populations are the same. We would call that an FST of zero. Okay. Alternatively, we might look at another place in the genome, like this one, and see here, everybody from population two has an A, and everybody from population one has a T. Those two populations are as different from one another as they can possibly be at that site. So either no difference in frequency, FST of zero, or 100% difference on FST of one, yeah? Okay, what we did was to go and measure FST across all these 49,000 genes and then average them together. And what we did was, so we first looked at, what if we compare this little group of Joshua trees that are Yucca brevifolia to these ones versus to these ones? And what if we do the same for Yucca jigariana? What we see is when we compare this to this, or this to this, FST is about 0.01, or awfully close to zero. Or another way of saying that is, Across a mile, looking just at Yucca brevifolia versus Yucca brevifolia, the trees are genetically extremely similar to one another. Yeah? Now we're going to do the same thing and compare Yucca brevifolia to Yucca jigariana. When we do that, we get an FST of 0.25. Not as different as they could possibly be, not one, but high ish. And it turns out if we look at other groups of organisms, for, so for example, if we compare coyotes and wolves, the FST between coyotes and wolves is about 0.27. The FST between Yucca brevifolia and Yucca jigariana, remember, this is trees that are separated from one another by a mile, is 0.25, yeah? So I think we could have a really interesting argument about whether coyotes and wolves are different species. They do hybridize, as a matter of fact. Not very often, but they do. But I'm gonna say for most people, when they talk about different species, coyotes and wolves, different things. And so I'm gonna say by the standards that most people would agree on, Brevifolia and Jigariana are as good species as coyotes and wolves are. Does that make sense? Time. Five minutes, is that what you're saying? Or time? Okay. Okay, I'm gonna get ready to stop, actually, but I'm gonna say we're now applying this same tool to start to ask, if these are really different species, is it possible that the different pollinators have what is what is making them into different species? We talked earlier about how natural selection driven by pollinators might be able to cause species formation. We're using these same genomic tools to now ask, is there evidence that there's natural selection acting on Yucca brevifolia and Yucca jigariana? And is that natural selection caused by the pollinators? Okay, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go into the evidence, but I'm gonna say that cautiously, it looks like yes. In the genome, we can find genes that are associated with flowers, and those genes, not only do they look like they're under natural selection, but they seem to be experiencing much more and much stronger natural selection than anything else in the genome. Suggesting to us that pollinators may actually be really important in making new species. We're not there yet. There is more to be done, but the genome seems to be opening the door to answering Darwin's abominable mystery. Why are there so many flowers? I am going to cut there because we are at 1227. Thank you very much, Chris, for that lecture.
as a former English teacher, I commend you for blending Shakespeare in with Yakis. I would like to know how we sign up for your, to audit your courses. I actually don't know the answer to that question. I think you need to talk to uh, Willamette Admissions. We do have auditing, and I teach a class called um, Principles of Biology. Um, th this past semester, I had 90 students in that class. Um, I thought it went well, but you should talk to most of my students. I would welcome people to audit that class. You have to talk to admissions about auditing. I have no idea how that works. <laughs> well, thank you very much, and I hope you'll come back another time. <laughs>